Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming and joining this uh, series of climate and environmental focused workshops that uh, CRS has been hosting with our partner organizations uh, through the fall and through the spring. We are excited to see the level of teacher engagement to support their students in learning uh, about these really important topics and how to not only begin to teach students, but give students the tools to think about how they themselves can take action and have some uh, active role to play in um, addressing these issues in their own communities and in, in the world that they're growing up into. And we think this is, uh, I'm really excited about today's program because I think this, uh, particularly for secondary teachers, is a real opportunity to give students some agency and um, some opportunities to really think about um, some important issues from a wide variety of points of view. And uh, that is just so important to developing their critical thinking skills. So I wanna thank uh, Haley and Eric and Regita for presenting this session today. And uh, I'm really excited to see what we're gonna learn. And uh, so welcome everybody. Thanks for coming and joining us. Yeah, um, should we get started? Sure. Cool. Um, well, welcome. If you'd like to, um, just while we're getting going, if you'd like to type into the chat your name and what grade you work with and where you're joining us from, that's also really fun for us to kind of get to know who's out there and with us today. Uh, the forum that we're going to be, the workshop we're going to be leading today is called Using Interactive Forums to Investigate Climate Hazard Resilience. And it's hosted by me. My name is Haley, and I work at Chabot Space and Science Center as one of our science educators and exhibit developers. And we have um, two other hosts. So if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure. Um, my name is Eric Havel. I work at the um, Community Resources for Science. I do pro professional development and environmental education programs, uh, mainly for, for, the, uh, for the group. Teresa, our executive director, is on the, on the call for the first half of our forum this morning, uh, our workshop. And I used to also just work with Chabot Space and Science Center for a long time, for 22 years, so um, know, know the institution well. So we decided to partner up on this project and we're excited to share it with you. It's something that I've experienced and, uh, and Haley and Rajuta have also been involved in. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Rajuta. I am currently a college freshman. Um, I'm originally from the Bay Area, but I go to college in Houston, Texas. Um, and I was a, I, I work at Chabot Space and Science Center as a college intern, I said, and I was not so long ago a secondary school student. So that's the perspective <laughs> I'm going to be bringing to this presentation. Yeah, so we're going to try to bring a few different perspectives. Um, but let's kind of get going. So we're going to be talking about um, this interactive forum that we're going to kind of introduce and overview the forum itself. Then uh, we're going to kind of have you participate in an expedited version of this forum. So we're going to have you actually take on the role of the participant and do a few of the activities that the forum includes so that you can get a perspective of the experience that you might have um, or that your students might have if you choose to host this forum. Um, and then we'll also at the end be talking and discussing a little bit about how you can adapt this forum and use it for your audience in a way that works for you. Um, so just to introduce and overview the forum itself, um, I'm going to ask Eric, who's actually participated in this Climate Hazard Resilience Forum multiple times, um, to kind of give us the background information on the forum itself. So Eric, take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Haley. So as we mentioned, uh, this is a project that we've done in partnership uh, with uh, the, the, actually the PI, the primary investigator, principal investigator on the project was Museum of Science in Boston, a huge museum science center that I visited multiple times. They got a large scale grant from NOAA uh, to, to do the project, to create this, this forum project. So, and then they partnered with other, um, other institutions. So Northeastern University, actually Arizona Science, uh, um, Center it, uh, also was involved, they're not listed here. And, and then some of these, the ECAS network to, for information and different aspects of the project. And the goal was to create this interactive forum that then could be shared out to science centers across the, across the, um, the nation. And it started with eight science centers, Chabot Space and Science Center being one of those. 
initially. And a number of years ago, we delivered an uh, in-person experience uh, at the center. Uh, we had about uh, 45 or 50 participants. And so you'll experience kind of what they experienced, but in a, in a slightly different way um, uh, digitally. And Rajuda and, and Haley are gonna speak to this in just a few minutes. Um, but the idea was, it's not so much about um, convincing folks of climate change or not, or looking at the climate science, it's really about preparing ourselves and becoming more resilient communities with the understanding that climate is starting to change and we need to figure out what to do and how to adapt to some of these extreme situations that we're already experiencing out there. Things like the wildfires and droughts of California, for example, and, and, and other things. So we'll, we'll kind of drill down into that and what the forum uh, brings to the table in terms of looking at those hazards and how we adapt and some opportunities for each of you to take this as Haley mentioned and adapt it to your audiences and your particular interests as you're doing this. Uh, they're designed as two hour long experiences. Um, and the idea is you take on a stakeholder perspective. So today we're gonna ask you to kind of step outside of yourself and represent an imaginary person in the community. Uh, and so as you can imagine, this requires kind of a level of understanding someone else's perspective of being able to communicate that with other folks that are part of your team. So that's kind of the idea um, of the climate, uh, the forum itself. And uh, you, so you can hold these as really big events. And now that we're starting to open things up again, there is an exciting opportunity probably soon, you know, for us to actually gather large groups of people in person together. That being said, um, this forum, because of COVID, it sort of um, sped up the process whereby uh, Boston Museum of Science took it on themselves to create a digital version, an online version of this with all the associated resources that you would need to run it virtually uh, as well as in person. So I kind of described a little bit about how I ran it in person at Chabot a number of years ago for an adult audience. But as I mentioned, Boston Museum of Science has now created a digital version and Rajuda is very familiar with this as she's run it multiple times. So I'm going to turn it back over to Haley and Rajuda to talk a little bit about the tools that were created in those, that experience, which we'll be presenting to you today on the virtual platform. Yeah, so um, the in-person version, <clears throat> if you choose to take that path, to forge that path, um, there is a series of downloadable PDFs and Word documents that you can get um, on the different versions of the forum. So if you choose to do drought or one of the other climate hazards, they have this big printable forum board that you actually gather people around and you play on the board almost like a board game and you have little printables. Um, so everyone is physically surrounding this board and playing. They also have participant workbooks that you can print out and have folks kind of write down their thought process um, to share out with the group or if they're more of a, a silent thinker, they can do that. Um, and then there's also background information packets there's also facilitation guides. So if you do choose to do this in person, you can actually print out a facilitation guide that's gonna help you like a script run through the program with a group of students or with a group of teachers, whoever your audience is. Um, and then like Eric said, they've also adapted this forum into a virtual program. So they have an Esri story map, which um, you may be familiar with, but if not, it's like an interactive website that uses uh, GIS, it uses mapping data, it has clickable links. Um, and we're actually gonna be using the Esri story map today for when we take participant, the participant view. And uh, so you'll get to know the Esri story map today, which I find is really um, user-friendly. Um, and Rajuda's actually done a virtual version of this forum several times now. Um, so Rajuda, if you'd like to kind of give us an overview of your experience doing this virtually, which resources have you used? Um, and yeah, what's, what's worked well doing it virtually for those that are considering a virtual forum? Yeah, so um, we were actually, re I, I first like got trained on the climate forum for the in-person version because this was, I believe, in early March of 2020 when we first got started with it, but alas, the pandemic <laughs> struck. Um, <laughs> so we had to um, adapt it for the virtual um, setting. And so essentially we just modified it. So instead of different tables, we just changed that to breakout rooms. Um, we modified the facilitator script in order to better match the online version. Um, there's a lot of screen sharing involved, um, a lot of screen annotation in order to sort of 
mimic that experience of being on a table and like moving pieces on a board. And um, one thing that I think is a special concern for Zoom is that people are a little less um, eager to speak in an online setting, I've found, um, especially when we did it with high schoolers, um, which I've done a couple of times now. So um, we really have to adapt it to meet the audience that you're working with in the setting that you're working with. So sometimes I find that it's necessary for the facilitator who's running this whole forum to take a bit of a stronger role, especially in the case where people aren't as eager to begin like discourse. But um, if you are in a setting where people are more eager to talk, that's when the facilitator can really step back. So um, I think that it's definitely a really exciting option to have. Um, I did it like my facilitator team was a group of high schoolers. So it's um, if we can do it, you guys can definitely do it too. And um, you can even train students to get involved as facilitators as well, because um, not participation is awesome, but also being a facilitator is an amazing experience. So yeah, um, I would recommend both sides. Great, thanks Rajuda. Um, and yeah, that's one of the things that we've been the most impressed with. Um, not to say that you wouldn't be able to do that, but just that we've been able to um, have our Galaxy Explorer program actually just run this hazard resilience for other teens and also for other adults. So um, it's a really cool program, but in order to understand a little bit more about the content and the purpose of this actual forum, we'll just give you a brief introduction on kind of climate hazard resilience and what these climate hazards are, kind of setting the scene. Um, and most of this information is actually included in the forum downloads and the forum background information packets. So even if you were to be giving this um, forum to a group, sorry, a printer is printing next to me. If you can hear it, I'm so sorry. It's very loud. Um, if you were to be doing this with a group um, and you aren't comfortable talking about climate hazard stuff, you can actually get all of this information from the website itself too. So this whole forum is based around this concept of climate hazard resilience, which is, you can kind of piece together what it might mean, but just to get us thinking and a little more involved, um, if everyone could just take uh, 30 seconds and type into the chat, or you can unmute yourself. We have a small group today um, and share out what does climate hazard resilience mean to you? What do you think that means? What do you think it takes to be climate hazard resilient? Um, so you can either type in the chat or you can unmute and share. And Eric, if there's anything in the chat, if you could read it out, because I can't really see the chat. No problem. All right, so thanks for starting to jump in. Um, uh, Jim uh, Jim uh, is, is uh, phoning in from Oakland as well. We're uh, Oakland natives together. We, Jim and I have worked together uh, at Chabot years ago as a volunteer, but his areas of concern are the idea of um, extreme weather, sea level rise, wildfires. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. kind of like, how do we deal with those things? And the communities need to prepare and also motivate uh, one another for action. And then Teresa shared the idea of um, how do we understand the risks of climate change and climate and take personal actions to prepare ourselves. Uh, and in addition, not just personally, but to work within the community space to prepare one another. And then um, we also have another understanding how climate change affects our community. These are all great and they're very much embedded in this project. So thank you. Thank you all for sharing. Any others? And again, feel free to Jump in. Chanmini has mentioned that uh, being able to tackle actions, to take um, to take action to to prepare and uh, take care of climate. So kind of this action oriented perspective, I'm hearing kind of really bubble to the top in terms of people's kind of thinking about this term of climate resilience. These are great. Yeah, 
And that's kind of a big, a big piece of it. So the forum itself defines it as a community's ability to withstand climate hazards while keeping its structure and function intact. So it's almost acknowledging that climate hazards are at this point almost undeniable. So climate hazard resilience is just trying to figure out the approach of, okay, if we're going to have drought, if we're going to have sea level rise, how can we withstand these hazards while still maintaining our societal function, our enjoyment of living, kind of this quality of life that we as humans want to keep having. So there's actually five steps to uh, resilience that have been kind of normalized and established by NOAA. And those steps are to one, identify the problem. So figure out what the climate hazard problem is itself. Two is to determine the vulnerabilities. So who's at risk? How are they at risk? Um, what are the different pieces of infrastructure and the different pieces of society that are actually impacted by this climate hazard? Step three is to investigate options. So how can we um, become more resilient to this climate hazard? What are the approaches that we can take to kind of strategize against a climate hazard? Step four is to then evaluate the risks and costs of each of those options. So kind of weighing your pros and cons, weighing your cost benefit, weighing your different stakeholders, the people involved. And then based on those evaluations, step five is to actually select a plan and to take action. And these steps to resilience are applicable across many different climate hazard situations, not necessarily just for this forum, um, but that's a way of kind of taking action and increasing resilience. Um, so this forum actually covers several different climate hazards. Um, they have different modules. And Eric, if you'd like to give us a little overview on what those are. Um. Sure. As I mentioned, the project was developed with a national audience in mind. So each science center uh, was trained on all four modules. And they are, just to list them out, their sea level rise, uh, extreme heat, heat waves, extreme precipitation, uh, and then drought. And the idea was that you, you know these are all climate hazards. They're not all of the climate hazards that are there. Certainly there's many things and these climate hazards often interact with one another and any given region could experience all of these, right? At some level uh, and picking up on a quote that Jim, uh, something in the chat that Jim shared um, as leaders and as educators, um, it's kind of, we're in this very special role with science communication, especially around climate change, because so much of the future is often depicted as kind of this gloom and doom, like what's coming and we can't control it and we have nothing, to, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. But the truth is we have the knowledge and the capacity through, uh, the, you know, uh, climate models, remote sensing platforms, we can see a, and know a lot about what the threats are and what's coming and what our actions mean. So the actions that we take can actually define a, a brighter and better future. Uh, we know that there's a lot of things happening with climate change and some of it is honestly very ominous, but again, as educators and what we're hearing so much right now from young people is they wanna be given this idea of a, of a positive future. How do, how do we get from here to a place that's sustainable and better? So that's what this is about, right? Is, is developing a dialogue around each of these hazards and we have the ability to see what's coming and prepare ourselves. And so um, that, that, that's what I really like about this forum is it, is it presents options for what we do about it. real tangible things that, that city planners, for example, have to kind of take in mind. It's, it's very flexible. We're gonna focus on one of these hazards, which Regita will introduce us to in just a second, but you could certainly do all four of them. Uh, and they're all germane, for example, to the Bay Area. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Rajuta to, to, to drill down on the one that we're going to focus on with you today during our uh, workshop. Yeah, so the one that we are focusing on today and the one that I focused on in all the forums that I've run is drought. So what is drought? Um, as it says on the slide, it's abnormally low amounts of precipitation over a prolonged period. But um, I think that it's important to like note that it's abnormally low. So even arid areas, like places that are normally very dry, like the American Southwest, for example, can have drought if they are especially low. And places that you don't associate with being um, like dry at all, as you can see on this map that shows kind of the degrees of drought, um, even places like um, in, you know, like the, the northern part of the United States can experience drought as well, places that we don't normally associate with drought. 
it's not just dry, but it's less rain than expected. Um, and so drought has major impacts um, on like the ecosystem, flora and fauna, um, living things rely on water. So when there is um, low precipitation, obviously your plants and animals are going to dry. And that's actually one of the way that we can sense areas of drought from outer space. We can look at the vegetation cover on um, different areas of land. And if they are um, lower than usual, then that's generally where drought is occurring. Um, likewise, um, that also leads to sort of decreased agricultural yields and crop growth and um, declining soil health because of the lack of moisture. And the, um, the lack of soil health, the general dryness, all of that leads to an increased risk of wildfires, which I'm sure that if you're in California, you're very, very familiar with at this point. So those are some of the effects that um, drought has on the general environment. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's kind of the introduction that you could give, um, introduction into the background of climate hazards and the one that we're gonna focus on today. Now here comes kind of the role playing, the time to turn on your imagination because in this forum, we actually introduce this city, this town of Ottawa, and they are dealing with drought. And this is an imaginary place, it's an imaginary town, but much of its issues are based on real studies of real cities and towns actually facing drought. And the people are based around actual civilians that you might find in a town like Ottawa. And the issues and the way that they come up with plans are very similar to the real life resilience planning that happens. So we're gonna get to know Ottawa. Um, and in order to do that, we're gonna flip on over to the Esri story map. <clears throat> so, this is kind of what the story map looks like. Um, if you've never used an Esri story map before, it's basically um, you have your screen in the middle, which is your main control panel, and you have a series of tabs on the top that um, for this forum, you actually just work from left to right on each of the tabs, and that takes you through the forum. So you can do an introduction to drought, and then you get to meet Ottawa. So we're looking through Ottawa, you can actually scroll through and get to know the different vulnerabilities. So what are the different pieces of infrastructure that exist in Ottawa? And how are they affected by drought or how do they rely on rainfall in order to function as they need to in their society? So for example, you get to meet Eagles Lake, which is a reservoir that holds rainwater and snowpack and kind of provides a resource of water for both agricultural and residential use. You get to meet Northern Industries, which is a local manufacturer that relies on water to cool down a lot of its manufacturing equipment. So when they face drought, the industry actually has to reduce their uh, production of the day or maybe even shut down because water is becoming too expensive or hard to find. You also get to meet Ottawa's local forest, which as Rajuda mentioned, is at risk of wildfires considering the lack of rainfall um, that they're facing. <clears throat> you also get to meet the residential neighborhood of Ottawa where the residents are using water for their daily use and their daily lifestyles and is affecting whether they are staying or going in the town of Ottawa. And you also get to um, get some information on the sources of water that they use. So how do they store their water? They have the Eagles Lake, but they also have a groundwater storage unit, which holds water over time and is then pumped out to people around the city. So focusing on that as well. And you get to meet their local irrigation district, which is a series of farmlands that rely on water in order to grow their crops. And the Ottawa River, of course, which is a river that runs through the city. And uh, depending on rain flow and rainfall and how water is managed upstream, that affects how the water downstream is um, flowing with its ecosystems and whatnot. So in the Esri story map, you can kind of lay the land, introduce, kind of tell the story of Ottawa and get to know all of the different pieces and parts that not only rely on water, but are affected by drought in different ways. 
And the next part of this is actually introducing the people, um, which is our stakeholders. So Rajuda, if you'd like to kind of introduce us to the concept of stakeholders, um, I'll just tab through to our next tab, which is our stakeholders tab. Yeah, so in my opinion, one of the coolest parts of the Climate Forum is the fact that you get to examine perspectives that aren't necessarily the same as your own. And the stakeholder part of the activity is kind of essential to that. So basically what stakeholders are, they're just imaginary community members um, based off of like real people that you might find in your town. Um, and they all, they all play different roles in the community and they all have different values based on their background and their profession, what they do for a living, um, what they value in the future. And they're all affected by drought in many different ways. Um, for example, like personally, your own, like how your life goes um, economically, perhaps their um, business, their profession is being affected by drought or um, like their interests in the future, like their life for their children, for example. Um, and it's pretty specific to each stakeholder. And all of their values must be taken into consideration when it comes to resilience planning, because it's not just one person's town, it's everybody's town. So this kind of stim um, simulates that like real life interaction between different groups of people who have different values. And I believe since we're doing the expedited forum, um, we're gonna have you guys take on the role of some of these stakeholders and do an activity with the story map. So Haley, if you, were you gonna yeah. assign the stakeholders? <clears throat> yeah, so each of you are actually going to get to know your stakeholder. And for the rest of this forum, we're gonna be kind of asking you to be in the mind of your stakeholder. Um, so, we have six different stakeholders and I think there's a little less than six of us participants. So I might take one on or maybe Rajuta, you might take one on. Um, but for now we have our construction company owner and we're going to assign this one to uh, Chen, Chen Moni. Am I saying that right? Yes. Okay, you're gonna be our construction company owner. James, you're gonna be our farmer. Nate, you're gonna be our manufa manufacturing plant manager. Lasia, you're gonna be our suburban resident. Uh, Rajuda, you can be our outdoor enthusiast. And Eric, do you wanna be the environmental group director or do you want me to be the environmental group director? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can be the environmental group director. So we're going to give you about three minutes um, to Sorry, read. Haley, I was on mute. I can do it. Too. Either way, <laughs> okay, I was saying yes. Either way. <laughs> so we're going to give you about three minutes to read through the bio of your stakeholder. And then once those three minutes are up, we'll just ask each of you to um, unmute and give a quick 30 to 45 second uh, overview of who your stakeholder is. So what do they do? How are they impacted by drought? What do they value? Um, and this way we can all kind of take a piece of this puzzle and then share out so we don't all have to read each of these bios. Um, but the stakeholder piece is a very important part. So we just want to make sure that um, we can kind of introduce this concept to you all. So you'll have three minutes. We're gonna put the link to the um, Esri story map into the chat. Rajuda has posted it um, and Nate has to leave. So that's okay. Um, thanks for joining us, Nate. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we might need someone to take on the manufacturing plant manager. Eric, if you wanna take on that one. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, we'll take uh, three minutes starting at 10.30. So you have until 10.33 to get to know your uh, stakeholder, read their bio, and then be prepared to share 30 to 45 seconds. If you're uncomfortable sharing out loud, you can always type into the chat. That's completely acceptable. No one's pressured to share out here. Um, so at 10.33, we will kind of call back attention and ask you all to share out who your stakeholder is, what they value. Teresa, do you want one? I know you have to leave. 
I, yeah, I have to jump out right now. I just sent Eric a <laughs> chat that said, this looks so cool. And I feel so sad that I have to jump out for a 1030 session that I have to That's okay. uh, That's hop okay. into, but uh, this is awesome. And I can't wait to watch the rest on the recording and I'm um, checking out this uh, story map link, which I think is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and just a reminder to everybody attending that we will share all these resources out with you. So you'll be able to both have them and encourage colleagues to check the recording, check the resources you can bring other people along as you learn about this and get excited so um good luck thank you so much and uh i appreciate everything you guys are sharing today bye thanks Teresa. And, we, and we do i i know there are some teachers who are wanting to combine these professional developments from the series in order to earn um academic credit and we have the forms available so if anybody who is attending um, is wanting to count this toward the academic uh, CEU from Dominican, uh, you can email Corinne afterwards or reach out and we'll give you the information for that. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks, Teresa. All right, so you have until 10.33 to read your bio on your stakeholder and be prepared to share a quick blurb. Um, if you have any questions, uh, unmute or type them in the chat. Um, yeah. I can stay for a couple more minutes here and uh, give my uh, stakeholder, a, uh, I guess, a decent do. Thanks, Nate. Okay. And I can tag team with you. I'll take over when you have to jump off. Good to see you again, too. I know you did the greenhouse yes. workshop with yes. us. You get the you right. get the calling in from out of state ribbon again all right <laughs> <laughs> should make one a patch <laughs> how, is, how are your high school students doing we are doing great uh we are back in person which is a good thing and uh, nice uh, everything is good everything is great All righty, it's 10.33, so um, try to wrap up preparing your bio, and then um, we can just go by whoever wants to share out first, um, whoever's prepared. Nate, if you want to go first, since you got to yes. get going. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that'll be great. Okay, so um, my stakeholder is uh, Jeffrey, and he's the plant manager of uh, a uh, company that uses uh, a bunch of water manufacturer plant that uses the, the, one of the largest water users in the city. And he's concerned about the, uh, the shortage, of course, and is that going to force him to uh, either uh, downsize the plant or completely shut the plant down? And, and both uh, is... Uh, probably weighing very heavily on them because if you downside, that means jobs will go away. And if you uh, use more water, then your cost is going to go up and it's also going to increase the, uh, the uh, shortage in the city. So he has a really big problem and uh, they can't reclaim the water because that's a, a, a terrible costly expense as well. Uh, but that's what he wants to do. He wants to use reclaimed water, but where's the money going to come from to uh, put that system in? So he has a big dilemma on his hand. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a big. That's a big. That's a big weight to carry. Poor Jeffrey. He's got a lot yes. going on there. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you, Nate. Um, so now we've got to know Jeffrey, who is our manufacturing plant manager. Who else would like to introduce their stakeholder? Uh, I'll go next, Chamani. 
Um, my uh, my stakeholder names is Lori, and Lori is uh, a home builder, and she's also an investor. So she investing a lot with the uh, Ottawa um, uh, new communities on the outskirts uh, of the town, and also uh, connected to the farmland. So her biggest concern is that if there's a shortage of water, she might not be able to sell uh, the you know to her customer. So that new home to the customer yeah that's uh that's her livelihood Lori. she just needs to sell those homes um so now we know Lori, our construction company owner who is kind of flourished in our uh, residential neighborhood who else would like to share so i can go ahead if that's all right well james james which one were you so I'm Patricia, the uh, local farmer. You're the farmer, okay. And of course, as a farmer, water is extremely important. It's, in fact, it's essential for that. And I get from uh, what we know about Ottawa that uh, the water is coming from below, as in, as in they're getting it either by canal or groundwater. I'm not too sure, even though I've lived here for 40 years, how much <laughs> precipitation we have. But um, but there's those different factors of it, and um, that uh, we're very proud that we're a local farm community. So people, this is actually food that people actually get in our community as well as what's ex exported. Um, and that means I also connect an awful lot with the community. So I'm reading stuff in here. Now, there's one one thing of uh, not only as a stakeholder as a farmer, this is a business, but my uh, nephews, nieces, and grandchildren are even more concerned about climate change and drought than, than much of the adults are, and uh, they want to see a lot of action. And that's one thing a lot of times we say stakeholders, that the children are not considered stakeholders. So I think uh, they're telling me that they're a stakeholder, essentially. Um, but I have to watch out for my costs. Uh, uh, because uh, if I do go to irrigation, that it's going to be costing a lot more. Um, and uh, but I, but there is a real sense of community here. We de we need to work together as a community. We have to recognize there's many different interests. Obviously, um, I m as a farmer, I take a great deal of the overall water. Uh, but that, and that's necessary. But I know that there's other needs for water too, just even for people drinking. Wow. Thanks, James. Um, and that's a really great point about considering the younger generations as stakeholders, which are not included in this forum. So that would be a great question to pose or a great thing to bring up if you were to do this with a group of students, perhaps um, ask to see if they actually see themselves represented in, in a forum like this and how would they incorporate that. So that's a really good point. I actually had not thought about myself. So thank you so much for that one. Um, we also had someone in the chat. Eric, do you want to read out the chat? Yeah. Can someone share on the suburban? Yep. Yeah, so Lassia is concerned. She's representing a suburban resident and is concerned that the homeowners got a lot of uh, you know, outdoor grass, trees that need to be maintained and they require water. And given the scarcity of water, this sort of increasing level of drought that we're experiencing now in Ottawa, uh, doesn't want to get rid of the lawn, right? This is this is a, a home. the The lawn and landscape brings value to the home and pleasure for going out and being, in, you know, within that space. So, it will be a concern, and it may may have to change the nature of of where I'm living, out here in the suburbs. Cool. Thanks, Eric, for for helping. Um, who else would like to go? I think we have two more, three more. I can go next. Um. Sure. Yeah, so I was the outdoor enthusiast, also named Eric. Um, but yeah, so I guess my um, my stakeholders family has been living in this area and really fishing in these streams for almost 60 years now. And so there's a real kind of family legacy on the land. And um, the drought really concerns me because you know, droughts could lead to wildfires that degrade the land, which also affects animal populations, um, not just on land, but also in the lakes and the streams. And especially with the fish, um, because droughts can lower the water levels with the stream, that could de that will definitely affect the um, fishes, the fish populations. And how the city pumps groundwater, that's another factor that affects the streams. And if the city continues to pump groundwater during the drought, that's an issue that will definitely affect the fish populations. 
So as someone who fishes very often and recognizes the importance of fishing to Ottawa's economy and tourism industry, um, just how the fish population and how water um, in terms of recreation is being affected is very important to me as well. Great. Thanks, Rajuda slash Eric. Um, <laughs> and then the last stakeholder is Anna, who is mine. She's an environmental group director. Um, and she cares a lot about the Ottawa River because she has, um, well, I, I'm Anna. I have a visitor center that runs along the river and I'm really concerned about the river, the levels of water in the river. And the more that we face drought, the lower the water flow is and the more that we conserve the water and store it upstream that also impacts the water levels that we're seeing. And I'm really concerned because I want that the, I want the water quality to stay healthy and I wanna make sure that we keep out invasive fish and plants out of the local streams, um, not only for the ecosystem's benefit, but also we have fewer visitors coming to the um, conservation center where we do fundraising events and we actually help raise a lot of money to take care of the river. So I care about the health of the Ottawa River because it not only benefits the, the visitor center that I work at, but also because it benefits the river itself and the ecosystem that we all live around. So a lot of different stakeholders to take into account here um, during this whole thing. And I think that's all of them. Did we miss anybody stakeholder? I think that was everyone. We got them all. Yep. And I will now become Jeffrey, by the way. <laughs> okay. Eric is Jeffrey. He's going to manage our factory. So um, hopefully you get kind of a feel of what this is like. And if you were to do this with a group of students, you could have students take on a stakeholder role. You could have multiple students work together to become a stakeholder if they are maybe a younger group, or you could introduce the stakeholders one by one, almost like a storytelling element. Um, but getting to know your stakeholders is really important um, because we know that drought is impacting the city of Ottawa. So this little tab, which I won't spend a lot of time on, just kind of shows how drought is actually impacting um, the city of Ottawa. <clears throat> so it uses a little bit more of mapping and visualizations to show you uh, where the greenness of Ottawa is, is lacking. So where we're actually facing drought and we're facing a lot of drought kind of in the main part of Ottawa. Um, they also have maps that show you the drought history of Ottawa showing that increasingly over the years, they've been facing more and more drought um, at higher levels. And they're also facing this issue of groundwater contamination, which is making it difficult for them to use the groundwater that they do have stored. So this kind of introduces, we now have our stakeholders, we now have our city of Ottawa, we kind of know what's going on. So what can we actually do? And this is where we get into the strategies. I'm going to flip back to the PowerPoint for just a minute to introduce the strategies because this is where this forum can get a little tricky. Um, so we've met everybody, we've assessed our vulnerabilities. So now we're considering what we do. Now, when we think about strategies and ways that we can assess climate hazard resilience, the, this forum breaks it down into three different types of strategic approaches. The first one is to conserve and protect. So that means to basically reduce water use that our city is using and to clean existing polluted water sources. So how can we actually take care of the water that we have and how can we protect the water that we have to save it and make it last as long as possible? The next strategy, the strategic approach is to invest in new supplies and storage. So this is to develop new sources of water and invest in ways to store water for the future. So how can we actually create new sources of water? How can we make sure that we're building new infrastructure to help assess this problem? And the third strategic approach is more of a prepare the public type of approach. So considering that drought is happening, it's going to affect the people. What actions can we take to minimize the impacts on the people that drought's going to have? So these are the three approaches that can be taken 
And the forum actually takes you through options for each of these approaches, which we'll show you in a minute and hopefully it'll make a little more sense. But it's kind of like, do you wanna conserve the environment more? Do you wanna build and invest in infrastructure or do you wanna just prepare the people? Now in each of these approaches, they're going to have an impact. And that impact can either impact the economy. So for example, new supplies and storage, it's gonna cost a lot of money to build new infrastructure. So it might have a different impact on the economy than for example, the conserve and protect approach where you're just asking people to reduce your water use, try to save as much as you can. There's also the impact on the environment. So some of the approaches are better for the environment. They um, create a healthier ecosystem or they're taking the environment more into mind in the way that they approach it. And the third type of impact that each of these approaches can have is on society. So what's the social impact of asking people to conserve and protect their water? What's the social impact of building new infrastructure and a desalination plant? What's the social impact of preparing the public? So each of the approaches actually has a rating on their economic, environmental, and social impact as you walk through the forum. So it's a little complicated. It's a little confusing. And Eric or Rajuda, if you want to jump in, I'm going to flip to the story map. Um, if you feel like there's any clarifications we could use on how those work. What I would add to that is, um, Keep your stakeholder hat on, right? So I'm Jeffrey, this this power this power plant manager with hundreds of employees, and I really need water to run my plant. You know, while all of those different sort of things are important in terms of strategies and the impacts, you know, with my stakeholder cap on, some of those are going to be more appealing to me as a plant manager. So I think that's kind of the context of this. You know, when we step out at the end and have a little conversation about the experience we're all doing today, we can put our own hats on and talk about our own perspectives, absolutely. But so that I would just invite you to keep that stakeholder hat on, even though you know you may have your personal opinions as well uh, along the, the lines of what Haley just shared with us. And it, it can get confusing, and we're just gonna take you through a piece of this uh, in just mm -hmm. a minute, just so you get a taste of it and then describe how you would kind of continue forward. Yeah, so this is kind of what it looks like on the story map as you start getting into the strategies. So we're going to focus today just for the sake of time and for this expedited version, we're going to have you all walk through this conserve and protect strategy. So looking at conserve and protect, um, as Eric uh, had just mentioned, there's going to be kind of the different values. So what does your stakeholder actually value when it comes to this concept of conserve and protect? And um, what the map has is an overview of what conserve and protect is. It has its economic rating, its environmental rating, and its social rating. So I'm a conservationist. I'm probably going to like this environmental plan because it's got a pretty good environmental rating. However, if I'm a business owner, that might be a little different for me. Um, and then below, it has the actual ways that we can approach conserving and protecting our resources. Uh, our resources. So it has a plan A and a plan B. Um, which we can um, walk through with you. Eric, do you want to walk us through these or we can go back to the slideshow and show the um, condensed version? What do you think? Um, we could just real, just kind of quickly run through it a little bit further. Um, and if, if feel free to popcorn in the chat too if you have questions about this sort of process. And again, we're, we're looking at one of the three strategies now right, that Haley outlined for us, just to give you a taste of this. And again, the value system. I like to think of those star systems as like the, the Michelin guide, like this is a five-star hotel, this is great <laughs> versus the one-star, you know, things aren't working, the light won't turn on kind of a thing. So from my, from my perspective as a business owner, I want to really think about what Jeffrey would think about each of these things and where he would prioritize this. Um, so um, what I would mention here is that if, if Haley, you scroll down just a little bit, you'll see a plan A and a plan B down here for conserve and protect strategy. The way this is designed is plan A is significantly more expensive and resource intensive than plan B. So if, you know, as Jeffrey, I'm thinking, okay, 
uh, is, is my priority to conserve and protect existing resources? Why or why not? And uh, would I intensively invest here knowing that there's some other strategies out there that I would be looking at later um, and a plan A and plan B in those respective strategies. So I kind of got to think about the moving parts, all the different strategies, you know, what, what my business needs and would likely, you know, as the owner would, would, would do here. Um, so that's kind of the lens through which we would like you to just get a sense of conserve and protect and we won't go to the building infrastructure and we won't go to raising awareness with the public today, but this forum is a two hour process, right? So you will have ample time to take each of the stakeholders through each of these strategies and, and uh, you know, imagining how they might invest. Um, so that's, that's kind of the context of, of this. Um, I think we wanted to give you just a few minutes now to hopefully you're back in that Esri story map and just read through plan A and read through plan B, um, give you about you know, three or four or five minutes to kind of read through those, kind of internalize them with your stakeholder uh, hats on. And then we're gonna do a, a little quick activity that um, Regina will and Haley will help us kind of navigate through in terms of where we're gonna invest. Well, it looks like we have, we're losing Lassia. It's okay, thanks for, thanks for coming Lassia. And this will be recorded, so um, so you can get the get the tail end of it online just by going to those links at the CRS website. So for the rest of us, the stakeholders, um, yeah, just take a few minutes to read through Plan A and Plan B. Yeah, if you need the the link to the story map again, we can repost it. But if you still have that link, it's the same link. Just go to the tab that says Strategy, Conserve, and Protect. Um, and then take about three-ish to five-ish minutes to read through this strategy and plan A and plan B. And then think about which plan your stakeholder would prefer. So would your stakeholder prefer plan A or plan B based on the values that they have, the costs, the benefits, all of those goodies. So at 10.55, I'll check in and see if everyone's ready with a decision, plan A or plan B. And then we'll try to wrap everything up by 11. <laughs> we'll do an expedited, expedited finish. <laughs> might go, we might go a few over. Be right back, Haley.
All right, it's 10.55, so I just wanna check in and see if we need more time figuring out whether we prefer plan A or plan B, or if everybody's ready to just do a quick little share out or type in the chat which plan you prefer, and maybe a little bit of why, what, what your stakeholder is considering. So do we need another minute or how are we feeling? I can jump in and share Jeffrey's perspective while folks are kind of wrapping up if you want. Sure, let's do it. All right, so, you know, Jeffrey, as we mentioned earlier, uh, as, as plant manager, I I really need to ensure supplies of water for my for my plant, you know? And so I, I'm, I think the community really needs to invest in um, this sort of increase. I recognize there's a large investment that's gonna be needed to um, get this new plant operational. So I really like plan B because it deals with water resources right now, but mm -hmm. I, I am for investing in the long term because I've, you know, I, I'm imagining my business will be going on quite a while in the future. So I, I think just going all in on plan A and, uh, and um, you know, building this, this plant that's going to clean the groundwater. I'm interested in, in reclaimed water, as I mentioned earlier. So yeah, that, that's, that's me and just all in on plan A. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> um, I can share on mine. I'm the, the uh, I keep wanting to say she's a conservationist. She works at, I work at the, uh, the visitor center, which is why I think I actually prefer plan B because um, I'm all for conserving and protecting, but the plan B actually has a demonstration project showing some of the, the water saving technologies and strategies in our local parks. And I think that that would actually behoove the visitor center to have these demonstrations and to get a little bit of this renovation um, that would not only draw people to the visitor center that I work at, but also um, we can help work with this education program that promotes sustainable water use so I feel like we would have a big role to play in, in the plan B that would not only help conserve and protect, but would also kind of help, help the visitor center and the river that I, that I work at. So um, I'm leaning plan B, but I'm also considering plan A because it has such a good environmental rating. I don't wanna ignore the fact that this is a very good plan for the environment and that's what I care about. So I'm a little on the fence, but I'm leaning B. Anybody else want to share? I can go next. Um, I, as like the outdoor enthusiast, both plans had me a little bit on the fence because while um, the, it does say that this conserve and protect strategy is very good for the environment, it does mention that um, it has environmental benefits only if you use the saved water for environmental purposes. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really say in either plan like, exactly what the saved groundwater is going to go for. But mm -hmm. I assume that if, um, like they say in plan A, if the city is cleaning polluted groundwater, that means that they're not going to pump more groundwater. And for me, as somebody who's kind of, you know, very concerned with the um, state of groundwater and as it relates to the streams and the forests of Ottawa, um, that is what I um, am looking for. So I suppose that I would support plan A. All right, thank you. Does anyone else want to share out which plan they were leaning towards or type in the chat or unmute and share plan A or plan B and why? I can go ahead. Um, it's pretty easy as a farmer to go for the plan A. It's obviously the end of the whole thing is kind of geared toward farmers and specific grants and so on to help irrigation, which in the, um, bio said that that was a real concern how that our irrigation would cost a lot more money mm -hmm. um it's kind of fun i do do some of these and uh, these different things uh, typically we have that um especially the education programs tend to go i'll see okay that's the b is really for us because it's trying to uh <laughs> you know this is saying there's going to be money for more education programs and so on and that's usually what we go for <laughs> <laughs> they often when there's a vote, everybody votes B, even if they're 40, <laughs> they go for A. So that wouldn't be a surprise. <laughs> yeah, I may have a little bias in my choice. <laughs> sure. As an educator. Thanks, James. Um, anybody else want to share? 
Well, uh, I'll share. As a home uh, home builder, I like Plan uh, A a lot because I feel like, you know, everything is from the uh, from the ground up. Um, you know, trying to um, conserve that water. But I wouldn't mind going for, with Plan B with the education as well. I think um, we all need to learn how to take care of our communities and our planet and so forth. But um, I'll uh, still uh, gear toward Plan A just because I think everything should, you know, start from where we are in a household toward the outside world. Great. So we can see we have, you know, slightly differing opinions based on our stakeholders. And like Eric had mentioned, still trying to battle that, uh, putting our stakeholder hats on, which is a personal challenge for me, uh, <laughs> keeping, keeping our own uh, ideas out of it. So this is how you would kind of run through. You would introduce conserve and protect. You would produce plan A, plan B, and you would reflect as your stakeholder, which you prefer. Then what would happen next is you would actually run through the same process with the second strategy, which is new supplies and storage. And you would then look at the ratings for new supplies and storage and you would look at the two different plans. So one might produce uh, building a desalination plant while the other might be um, expanding aquifers. And then you would, as a stakeholder, decide, do I like plan A or plan B better? And then you would repeat that process with the third strategy, which is that prepare the public. So you would consider its ratings, economic, environmental, and social, and then you would look at plan A or plan B and decide which of those plans um, you prefer as a stakeholder. Then the next step, and because we're almost out of time, I'm just gonna kind of run through how the rest of the forum works um, so that you understand the end game here. But the final step, well, one of the final steps is once you've gone through each of the three strategies. I don't know what I'm typing. <laughs> There's a lot of different things. Um, once you are, you've gone through the three strategies and you've considered plan A or plan B, then it's time to actually come up with a resiliency plan. Now this is kind of finalizing, considering all three strategies. You're a city planner and you have to consider all of your stakeholders and come up with a final plan considering your budget as well. So, at this point in the forum, your table, your table of stakeholders would actually converse and decide on a resiliency plan. And in order to do this, um, you kind of have your conserve and protect, your new supplies and storage, and your prepare the public, plan A and plan B. And taking into consideration that this is a real uh, scenario, you actually have a real budget. So you would select plan A or plan B based on your table's preferences. So you have to work as a group to actually debate and decide on a final plan. Um, Eric or Rajuda, do you wanna um, add anything to that explanation? Sure, there's kind of a mechanic uh, that the, the way this works too, the way it's designed is we took you through that first one, conserve and protect, but you're actually allocated, each, each uh, table group is allocated three coins. Um, and so, and one of the nuances of this is you can't invest uh, all of those on one area. In other words, you can't put it all in conserve and protect. So I can't put all my three coins there. Keeping in mind plan A is much more resource intensive than plan B. Other than the fact that you can't put them all in one bucket, one strategy, you can just, you know, put them out across as much as you want. You don't also, you don't have to use them all. Um, and there's also a two part process to this. So in the workbook, as your stakeholder, you're asked to make your own decision first mm -hmm. and share, like we did, share our thinking, share our decision-making process. So you'll fill out your own plan and have that sort of in place with your sort of arguments for why you chose that path. And then the ultimate goal is to have the table group of six constituents, stakeholders come together and come to some kind of consensus. And this can be really challenging because we all have different perspectives, right? And it's, it doesn't always work out. But in the dialogue that I was hearing, folks were kind of leaning towards that plan A. Everyone liked both, but I heard a little more emphasis on the plan A idea. 
but then keep in mind that you're going to have to figure out if plan B or you know, strategy B or strategy C are more appealing, that could change your decision making around the uh, strategy A. Yeah. Rajita, do you have anything to add before we just kind of show how to implement? Um, no, I would just say that um, like the whole debate and discussion part when it comes to actually running the forum can be a little bit difficult to like get started, especially if you're working with a group of people who like, um, especially with high school students, we did it with a group of people who weren't necessarily all too familiar with each other as well. So um, it can be a bit difficult getting that debate started. But in general, I find the best way to do it is to ask somebody to share out what they thought first. Mm -hmm. And um, just if anybody agrees or disagrees to bring that up. And hopefully from there, you guys can get like a really good dialogue, a good conversation started that will eventually lead to a single plan for the entire group. And in, in my past experiences, I've also noticed that there's always a bit of a negotiation going on between <laughs> different groups of stakeholders. So that's also something um, it's fun to watch. And it's also very, I, I feel like it's very realistic as well. So um, just keep an eye out for that as well. Yeah, those are all, that's great for adding in. Um, <clears throat> and that kind of helps under, explain it a little better. So once you've actually come to a group decision on a plan, you submit your resiliency plan. So using your three tokens, maybe you come up with uh, plan A for conserve and protect and plan B for new supplies and storage. As you can see in this Esri story map, they provide every potential plan possible. So maybe you just do plan A for prepare the public. Maybe you go two plan Bs, maybe you go three plan Bs. So the Esri story map has all of the different scenarios and on the, um, the in-person version, there's actually um, some YouTube videos that actually explain each of these. So, but on the Esri story map, you can actually click. So if we were to go with this plan uh, O2, click on that one, which is having selected plan A for conserve and protect, which is the one that our group had a been leaning towards a little bit more, and then plan B for prepare the public, which we didn't actually dive into. Um, then you implement your plan. So you kind of press play and see what happens if you choose plan A for conserve and protect and plan B for prepare the public. Say we all had a debate and this is what we came to. Um, the story map kind of shows you the different, uh, the overview of your plan. It shows you the resulting water use and water supply. So that plan uses um, less water as a city, but our water supply increases, not a whole lot, but slightly. Um, and then you can see how Conserve and Protect actually um, created the impact while it loads. <clears throat> so using Plan A for Conserve and Protect, for example, our groundwater treatment plant, uh, it now cleans pollutants from the groundwater, which was a big issue that we were dealing with. And that treated water is pumped back into our aquifer. After several years, that groundwater will be safe. So we've increased our water supply. Many of the business residents um, installed water saving measures, which is great, which lowered um, water use as a society. And uh, a lot of the farmers, as we were looking in plan A, they installed that irrigation system that we were looking at. Um, then you can also evaluate the results on the prepare the public side, which we didn't go into, um, but just for the sake of showing, it would then show you how using plan A, plan B for prepare the public resulted in emergency shelters that were built in case of a fire, <clears throat> um, water trucks to prepare moving water to people when they're facing extreme drought, wildfire prep. So this is kind of giving you that um, overview of the choices that you've made. And then it also has these, um, <laughs> it kind of gives you an overview on the stakeholders. So how are the people actually affected by the plan that you chose? And the way that they do this is by giving you these little simulated headlines, which tell you a news event that happened. So turf gone and homeowners are concerned about home values. So because we decided to uh, ask civilians to replace their grass with gravel, a lot of homeowners are unhappy about that. 
So you can actually scroll through these little news articles that update you on how the city of Ottawa and the people and your stakeholders are reacting to the decision that was made. And this is an option that you can look through every scenario, <clears throat> but ultimately you would come up with your scenario as a group, submit it, see what it looks like to actually implement that plan. And then you have an opportunity to revisit your decision. You can reevaluate your plan and you could submit a new plan. So you actually have this opportunity to kind of revise what you've done. If your table um, discusses this implementation and decides that it's not ideal or it's not something that you were hoping for, you have an opportunity to resubmit a new plan. Um, and then you would, once again, implement it. You would select it on this page, pick it, and then see how that implementation works. And then the final step is that everyone submits a final plan and then those final plans are shared out to the larger group. So each table is responsible for submitting their own plan and then they share it to the larger group. If you're doing an in-person version, that's kind of how this works. If you would do it virtually over Zoom, maybe the breakout rooms would submit their final plans and then in a big group room, everyone would kind of present their final, final findings. And that's kind of how you um, would wrap it up. So there's a lot of discussion and kind of, um, facilitation that can happen at the end, a lot of guiding questions where you would evaluate the real life impacts of going with a plan like this or a plan like that. Um, and it kind of brings this human element into the final steps of, of this forum. Um, Erica or Judah, do you have anything to add before we wrap up with adaptations and stuff? Oh, I think I think that's a good summary. Cool. And thank you all for staying uh, a little over. So this forum is a lot. I know that was probably a lot of information and it might've been a little overwhelming, um, but the good news is depending on where you're at, depending on what grade you teach, there's a lot of ways you can adapt this forum. So we showed you the Esri story map version today, um, but you can adapt it for online, which Rajuda has done. Um, Rajuda, do you wanna say anything about how you might adapt forum online? Yeah, so um, I kind of mentioned this a little bit before. What we did was instead of um, using like in-person tables, we did breakout rooms. Um, each breakout room has its own facilitator. Sometimes we did two facilitators as well, which was nice because um, that way it's not one person taking on every single part of the facilitator role. Some people can do the sharing screen aspects of it. Um, while other people introduce different, like the different strategies, for example. Um, and I, yeah, I thought that the two person system worked just as well as the one person system with the right amount of communication. Um, that's another thing that's very important if you happen to be running a um, online forum, uh, communication between all the different facilitators in different breakout rooms is important. So you can make sure that you're timing everything correctly. So that way everybody ends at around the same time and everybody um, can get back to the main meeting room to share what they thought up with. So um, generally what we did for that was we used a Google Hangouts group. Um, although you may have a more sophisticated method of um, in like with like intergroup communication, I find that that was a very simple method that worked well for us. Um, and I would also say that um, if you want to give your students a chance to participate as facilitators, I would 100% recommend that because um, once you've participated in the forum, I think facilitating it is the next natural step. Um, it's just not taking it to the next level. Now you're in charge of kind of, I, well, facilitating the conversation. And um, it's a great way to learn um, in different ways. Because every time that I've done the climate forum as a facilitator, I've learned something new from the different groups of people in the um, participating in the forum. So yeah, that is what I would recommend. And then in terms of like doing this, that my experience running it was the lead facilitator role as it with an in-person experience. So as Rajuta just kind of shared, I scaffolded the process. I worked with the facilitators and I ran them through as participants, kind of like what you experienced a little bit of today. So it's it's great to completely run through it as Rajuta shared first 
as a participant, and then that gets you to the next place where you can facilitate it. The tools that we mentioned uh, that are provided by this project are tremendous, both for the participant and the facilitator down to the level of it being scripted out. So you're really handheld through the process. So rest assured, like if you just take this methodically, uh, you, you've got everything, they provided everything for you. Uh, just give yourself time more than anything, give yourself time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in, in person, you can imagine it's a very dynamic experience. So being, being a, a good facilitator is about getting folks to step into the conversation and step out, right? Because you want to hear all the voices of the stakeholders. Everyone's opinion is important. Sometimes you'll get that one person sort of wanting to kind of contribute a lot, but then the other voices aren't being heard. So in an in-person environment, also in the breakout rooms that Regina described, very, very important to have that kind of skill of sharing the conversation across your table. And as a facilitator, it's tricky, but your voice you want to sort of dial down, right? And let those other voices be heard because you're facilitating some decision-making and conversation among your group. Um, the other piece I would mention is being flexible, right? Because this is based on pods of six plus a facilitator, but what if you only have five? Or what if in our case, we started off with five participants we pivoted right away and made one of us a participant. And then we lost two or three along the way. You know, these things happen, right? Life happens. So you have to kind of, maybe you only have a pods of four or five or you, you know, the facilitators are able to, to jump in as a participant last minute. So that's the beauty of Rajuta, what she just shared. Uh, the idea that one of the facilitators, if you had two, could jump in as a participant right away uh, in the moment. So uh, the other thing is, you know, the first time I did this at Chabot, we did two modules. We, we did drought. We also did sea level rise because sea level rise with the Bay, San Francisco Bay is very germane to our region. We're worried about the long-term impacts of rising shores around the Bay and the infrastructure that, that, that could be impacted. So that's a real life concern. That's why we picked that other module. You could do modules simultaneously if you wanted. You could do modules over different lengths of time. It doesn't have to all be one day. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of different approaches and we mentioned every module, all four of the hazards that, that, that they've created resources for could be germane. I think they would be germane to the Bay Area specifically, but they could be germane to, to many different regions across the country. So kind of check them all out if you want to try this out and try the one that, that resonates with you the most and, and your student group and the region that you're working with. There's also um, adaptations you can take um, if you are doing this in different venues. So um, maybe you have multiple classes doing different scenarios and then kind of converging at the end about what they've learned. You can have different rooms covering the different topics. It's something that Eric, we've done at Chabot before. One group did sea level rise or the other one did um, drought. So you can kind of, change this based on your venue. If you're doing it with a group of teachers, you might do a presentation style. Um, another way to modify this forum is by grade. So this forum is originally established for adults from the public. Um, however, as we've seen with our Galaxy Explorer program, this can be done by high schoolers. This could even be done by middle schoolers. Um, we haven't done it with a middle school audience before, but you can modify this program, use more of a storytelling approach. You can do more group decision making as, as a stakeholder, as a group of stakeholders. You could also try to gamify this and turn it into more of a game approach. Um, and you can also modify the time span. So this form is designed to be done in two hours, which you don't have to do it in two hours. You could do it over several days. You could introduce stakeholders way ahead of time and kind of give students um, or teachers, your audience, some time to get into their, the mindset of their stakeholder, do a little bit of role playing, um, and you can also break it apart. So the chunks that are complicated, you don't have to try to explain them all in, in 30 minutes like we did just today. You can actually take the time out to explain these things in a digestible manner. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can adopt this forum to kind of meet the needs that you're looking for. Um, and you can always reach out to myself or to Eric and we can kind of brainstorm with you. Um, you can also reach out to the folks who provide this forum materials and see if they have any advice. Um, it's kind of just a, 
a public domain <laughs> resource. So we're all just trying to find ways to improve it as we go. And so um, just real quick before we finish, trying to help you figure out ways to get started. Um, okay, we've got a question in the chat. I'm not sure. Um, so ways to get started, we would recommend checking out the Esri story map, which you have the link to. Um, you can also download the materials and dig into the facilitation guide if this is something you do want to pursue. Maybe um, you might not want to do it this year because we're ending the, ending the school year very soon. But if you'd like to, you can kind of dig into all of those downloadable materials because there's a lot of them. But Digging into them kind of helps give you a, like a robust understanding of how this forum works and its purpose. You can try to participate in a forum if possible. As Rajuda had said, being a participant is a great first step to get the understanding of how this works. And then you can actually like become a facilitator. So if you wanted to actually grow your group of facilitators, you could facilitate or lead a small group forum and then use that as a training session. So if you have a group of students, maybe you have um, a group who's really interested in this content set, you could do a small training session with them by having them participate and then turning them into facilitators. Um, and then you can also test it out with different classes or clubs, and you can also test this out with teacher groups. So if you have teachers who are interested, you could do a group session with a group of teachers and then kind of use that group group brain to develop adaptations and work on it together um, with teachers from your school or from your district even to kind of um, expand this resource. Because um, ultimately that's what it is. It's a resource and it's a tool. You can choose to use it. You can choose to forego it, um, but it doesn't require heavy science knowledge to participate. It requires empathy, communication, discussion, um, an understanding of weighing pros and cons, which is something that many students are able to do um, and can make us all feel like we're important. We can make decisions when it comes to this kind of stuff, which is ultimately the goal. So Erica, would you have anything to add before we finish up? I would just say that I highly recommend training your students, especially if they're on the older side to facilitate this program after they participate, because um, it's a great way of introducing students into um, like a more adult world of how these stakeholders work. I know that um, earlier we had a comment in the chat that like younger students may feel that they are stakeholders, which they are, but they aren't represented in here. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a way for them to in get introduced into the conversation as it exists without them so far, and then maybe consider ways for themselves to get involved as student stakeholders, not as the stakeholders presented in the forum. So I would recommend that very much, training them as facilitators. Yeah. And I might just add, there was another component that um, was in, in a Created into the in-person experience, we actually brought um, environmental planners in, and at lunch they actually had some real dialogue. So they were local Bay Area environmental planners, two of them, and they 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 spoke about their roles and positions, and actually facilitated a sort of a real conversation. So I think that's a great follow-up idea what Rajuda shared. But the idea of now I get to take my cap off and be myself, or mm -hmm. I about how I would tweak this to, to bring student voice to it or to bring personal voice to it. And really that's the fun part about the idea of iterating your decision process too, because you, know, you make a decision with these tokens, you see what the visualizations provide, which are very creative and fun. Mm -hmm. And then you can do it again. And you could even say, okay, now I'm gonna take my stakeholder cap off and do what I would really do and then see what the results of that are. So, so have fun with it. It is, it is kind of a game in and of itself in a way. Um, but but there's there's a lot to it and it's really well thought through, which I that's what I appreciate about, appreciate about this program, and just addressing Jim your your idea about presenting it at the Clean Work Network. Totally open to that. You know David Sittenfeld has, has presented before. He's the um, project manager on this for the Boston Museum of Science. I bet that he would be he would be keen to to share this too. Like if we did it as a team approach. And Haley, I can talk to you, Regina too. Like if, this is this network that Jim and I are part of that we meet weekly, and there's a lot of different climate uh, practitioners there, right? ranging from government folks to educators at all levels, you know, K-12 plus college and, and many others. So 
so definitely I'd love to explore that idea, Jim. Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks for thanks for sticking it out, Gemini and Jim. Appreciate you being here with us through through the end. And like Haley said, reach out to us with questions, comments, ideas, uh, and support. Thank you, Guy. That was great. I will definitely use it. Great. Yeah, the hope is um, the follow up email that'll come after this with um, a series of links will include the link to the main page where you can actually download uh, like it's a, it's a Dropbox folder with all of the different resources and to download those things. It's a simple request form where you put in your email and your your purpose. So what are you going to use the materials for since all of this is coming out of uh, Boston Museum of Science, as well as NOAA, as well as Northeastern University and uh, ECAST, all of those organizations. Um, the main thing they ask is just to give credit and to just, um, when you ask for the downloadable materials, just let them know what your goal is. Um, but the ultimate purpose is to spread awareness about climate hazard resilience, climate hazard planning, and to kind of include everyone in the conversation. So science nerds and, and not science nerds. So yeah, feel free to reach out if you have questions and those resources should have um, all the links to get you started. And yeah, thank you all so much for sticking it out. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions or anything before we wrap? All right, cool. Thank you all so much. Uh, hopefully the sun will come out. You can enjoy the rest of your day. Um, but yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be it from us. We'll see you next time. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Talk to you later, Jim. We'll, we'll make a plan. And Tammany, let us know how to help.